Why do I consider brown rice to be the best grain available? And why are endospores the least of your concerns when sterilizing? What makes a good or bad grain? Let's discuss these things. What is up everybody? This is Michael File Sage checking in here today. And in today's video, we will continue our discussion of brown rice. So in this installment, I would like to talk about why I consider brown rice to be the best grain available, especially for the small scale grower. Along with addressing some misunderstandings I see about what quote unquote clean grains are and about the sterilization process that rarely anybody acknowledges because rarely anybody knows about this side of it. So let's get right into it. Why do I consider brown rice to be the best grain available? Well, first things first, brown rice is literally the cleanest grain available, especially food grade brown rice, as it has no endospores. What are endospores? Think of them as bacteria that surrounds itself with Kevlar and goes into a cryogenic sleep. They can comfortably survive boiling temperatures as a result and are happy to wait hundreds of years for the perfect conditions to germinate and contaminate your grow. That's why all other grains will need to be pressure cooked, whereas brown rice can simply be prepared by steaming. Now, having said that, I still highly recommend getting a pressure cooker or an instant pot. Instant pot, please, please sponsor me. The next reason is availability. Brown rice is available in most supermarkets in many places around the world. Feed stores may be readily available in rural areas, particularly in the United States with brands like Tractor Supply, but they can be hard to access if you live in a big city or don't reside in the US or Canada. And even if you do have access to feed stores, the quality of grains are much lower than food grade brown rice since they're feed grade, right? So it's gonna vary from grain to grain and batch to batch. Now on this topic, I would like to touch upon something that I see many people not fully understand. And I'm sure I'm gonna get some comments from people who don't watch this part of the video saying something along the lines of, you're not sterilizing your grains long enough to kill endospores if your grains are contaminating. Mm -hmm. Well, this is true to a certain extent, but it's a huge oversimplification of the whole sterilization process. If you have an instant pot or a pressure cooker, then endospores are the least of your concerns, as all you need to do is pressure cook it long enough to neutralize them. Whoa. Hmm. simple. What they fail to recognize is all the other factors that can lead to contamination. Now endospores, despite their mythologization as some kind of supernatural mycocryptonite, are in fact very easy to deal with. But how about the toxic byproducts of certain bacteria, molds, microorganisms, cryotoxins, living pesticides, and fungicides, and how they all interact with each other? This is what I'm referring to when I say dirty grains. You may neutralize the bacteria, you may neutralize the molds and the endospores in a sterilization cycle, but you don't get rid of all their byproducts, excretions, metabolites, and everything else they left behind. They're still just sitting there inside your nasty jar and they can cause your mycelium to seriously suffer as a result. Now I'm gonna use a bit of a nasty example. If we have any children, please step out. So let's say you take human poop and sterilize it. Does it make it safe for consumption then? because you've dealt with all the bacteria? I think the answer is pretty clear. So following the availability, another factor is size. With feed grains, you must buy them in larger amounts, usually 50 pounds and upwards. It would take anyone growing for personal reasons or generally small scale growers, many, many months at least to get through a whole 50 pound bag of grains, during which time the grains are liable to insect infestations and the resulting frass. Now this is gonna cause your grains to become completely useless as they'll start to contaminate more and more over the weeks until it becomes wholly unusable. True story. Now again, it's not just the endospores that are causing contaminations at this point, but the poor quality of the grains because of all the toxic junk it has accrued upon it. Now with brown rice, you can get them in much more reasonable quantities. I buy my rice in two kilogram bags and each bag can make around eight shoe boxes. I would say about like seven comfortably. And despite it costing more than a 50 pound bag of grain, if you were to buy like 50 pounds worth of brown rice at the same price that I'm getting it, it's still very cheap considering the quantities of mushrooms I could grow and not having to worry about contaminations, both 
inside the jar and outside the jar, AKA the kitchen where I store it. So I won't get like a bunch of moths and all other sorts of insects around, right? So, which brings me to my next point, the price. So this is one of the few points some will list as a negative of brown rice. And believe it or not, I agree with them. Yeah, you're right, you know? <laughs> if you intend to grow large quantities of mushrooms consistently, then you're gonna go through lots of grains. It's a way of the universe, right? So which will obviously add to your overall cost. So for larger scale growers especially, the cost does add up. This is why I recommend brown rice primarily for the hobbyist rather than for the commercial grower, unless you have access to cheap rice, which is more common in Asian and African countries rather than North America and Europe. It's not really sort of rice cultures, right? But at least in North America, you can get feed grains much cheaper than food grade rice. And I always recommend to get the grain that makes the most sense for your purposes based on what is available to you. For example, if popcorn is easily accessible, cheap and efficient to prepare for your purposes, then use popcorn. If oats are cheap in your area and are clean enough and you can prepare them fine, use oats. I am not a grain zealot, let me make that clear. I'm just making this video in response to like a whole lot of misunderstanding I see regarding rice grain as some kind of inferior grain, which is this assertion that could not be further from the truth. But you may be wondering, so Sage, are you saying that grains are interchangeable? Pretty much. Technically, technically, certain grains are more nutrient rich than others. True. Rice, as a matter of fact, is very high on that list in terms of nutrient content out of all the common grains used in this hobby, with popcorn at pretty much the bottom. Help me. Help. So why do I say it doesn't matter still? It's simply because any grain, including popcorn, will have loads of nutrition anyways for the mushrooms, far more than they will ever get in the wild. So as growers, most people are going for a good first blush. You want to get as much yield as you can in a short amount of time as you can. And I would just like to add that nutrition is not the end-all be-all as many beginners tend to think. As I had just mentioned, grains contain far more nutrition than they get in the wild, and that's not necessarily always a good thing. Because as you increase the nutrition, you also increase the chances of contamination. So how do you optimize a good first flush? Simple. First and foremost, good genetics. Secondly, you're going to need good fruiting conditions. Any cereal grain has more than enough nutrition to pop out a huge first flush as long as your genetics actually know how to take advantage of it. A lot of beginners make a much bigger deal of grain nutrition than necessary, but the fact of the matter is that they are all nutritious enough for growing. Instead of grains, you need to focus more on genetics that can actually take advantage of it. So it can make use of most of the grain's nutrition in one flush and get started on a new grow. And of course, I'm assuming that you got decent enough fruiting conditions. That's important, but it's not as important as genetics because nature is ultimately stronger than nurture. This is the most efficient method for growing large amounts of gourmet and medicinal mushrooms, as you're not wasting real estate for lesser subsequent flushes. So now let's move on to another benefit of rice, and that is the ease of preparation. Rice does not require an overnight soak to hydrate slash hatch endospores, which by the way is sort of a contentious issue that I'm not gonna get into for time's sake. It is essentially a modified flash prep method that actually properly hydrates your grains. For those who don't know what flash prep is, it's a method of preparing grains as quickly as possible, AKA in my opinion, it's just a shortcut. And you guys know what I say about shortcuts. There's no such thing as a shortcut in this hobby. I have tried the flash prep method for rye multiple times and it was completely insufficient to properly hydrate the grains, leading to excruciatingly long colonization times and eventually stalling. Not stalling. I would have to inject 60 plus cc of sterile water before they would start up again. There's other sort of like quick prep methods for grains, but as the saying goes, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Shortcuts often end up being long cuts in the end, and you're gonna have to make up for it much more later on. Sort of similar to like sort of how all-in-one bags, for example, are much riskier than doing each step separately, but properly. But at least in the idea, it's like, oh, wow, we got an all-in-one bag. All you gotta do is shoot the syringe that I bought from here, and then all you gotta do is wait, and it's gonna take care of it. It's not true, guys. A lot of people just end up wasting months with nothing. More steps, but much quicker and more successful outcomes in general if you were to separate it and do it each uh, properly. But in the case of brown rice, this quick preparation method is not a shortcut, but simply the only way 
Yes, I said it, the only way, bar some minor adjustments here and there to get viable grains. And I say the only way because with brown rice, there's really not much like um, much deviation room because of the starch content. Now, I may be wrong though, but this is pretty much the only successful method that I know works well. The easy prep of brown rice is just a feature of the grain. So now moving on, let me list some of the main negatives of brown rice. The first major point is its high starch content. Because of this, deviation from the preparation method is less forgiving than any other grains, as rice, again, is very high in starch. Too much boiling or not rinsing fast enough can cause an unusable sticky mess. That's what she said. <laughs> the second point is also related to managing starch and that you're gonna need an efficient system to quickly rinse and cool down your brown rice after sterilizing for larger batches. That is, it's easy to quickly rinse two quart jars worth of rice, but you're gonna to need to have a system in place for 10 quart jars worth of rice. It's not too bad though, you could work around it. You know, you could take a monotub, you could take like a, a screen door, put it over there, take a garden hose, and just, you know, spray that down. Just an idea. Now, the other negative is the price. The cost of food grade rice is much more expensive to buy than feed grains for larger operations, as mentioned earlier. So now, in this final part of the video, I would like to discuss and analyze why rice is rarely listed as a good grain in comparison to other cereal grains such as oats, rye, and millet. So the first reason is its association with beginner techs, namely Uncle Ben's tech, Broke Boy tech, and PF tech. This is because, as mentioned earlier, brown rice has no endospores, therefore, Beginners don't have to invest in a pressure cooker to get started, which is the first major, like that's like the major cost, right? That's the major barrier of entry for most people into this hobby. That's why Uncle Ben's tech became so popular, right? Because you don't need a pressure cooker even. You don't even need to steam it. So basically this was the line of reasoning for at least for PF and Broke Boy tech, which by the way, if you don't know what these methods are, don't worry. Since all that's really important for our discussion is that all these methods don't need a pressure cooker. That's basically the point I'm trying to make here. And then more recently, we also have Uncle Ben's and Instant Rice Tech, which I just talked about, which are associated with higher contamination rates due to less control over your grill. Sort of like the all-in-one bags, you know, it seems like a shortcut, but in reality, it's it's not. Uh, so this tech, you know, Uncle Ben's Tech does serve its purpose for those starting out, but eventually you're gonna wanna move on towards more consistent and reliable methods, not to mention far cheaper. So the second reason is the misguided belief that rice on its own is too starchy to use as grain spawn. Now in the past, rice was embraced only when grounded into flour and mixed with fine vermiculite, AKA PF cakes. The addition of vermiculite ensured that the rice remains loose and thus avoid clumping, which will make it tough for your mycelium to grow in and encourage contamination. So it was believed for decades that rice was just far too starchy to be used on its own as one might use other grains. This belief permeated for a very long time until a Reddit user named Unemployed MT introduced the Broke Boy Tech in 2018, which is the method the previous video was based upon, albeit with some modifications. Now, his method basically reminded the cultivation world that rice is very viable. Yes, that's correct. Reminded. Because back in the 50s to the 1980s, thereabouts, brown rice was not a wholly uncommon grain spawn. Some notable users of brown rice were the legendary mycologist Stephen Polak, who was most notable for discovering Florida grass lovers in the 1970s, one of my favorite species, and Albert Hoffman, yes, that Albert Hoffman, who used brown rice as grain spawn to grow the first flavonoid-rich mushrooms back in the 1950s. You know, that he got from Maria Sabina, from which he extracted our lovely flavonoids for the first time ever, and introducing us, the Western world, or I should say the rest anywhere outside of Mexico, pretty much, beloved umami-rich mushrooms. So this idea that rice is too starchy to use on its own as grain spawn is simply an outdated notion that has been proven time and time and time and time again that it is completely viable and thrives as grain spawn. As the saying goes, a bad craftsman blames their tools. So guys, that's the video for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. A little bit of a deep discussion. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about. And you know, this channel is all about taking down misinformation, keeping it simple. That's pretty much it guys, self-reliance. And all the ways that you can support me are in the description if you like my work. Thank you very much guys for your support. And I'll see you guys next time. Be sure to hit that like, comment, hit the notification bell when you subscribe. And I'll see you guys in a future episode. Microfile Sage, checking out for now. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Thank you.